Victor knows the fine details of insuring firms like yours. For over 60 years, Victor has provided outstanding service and broad, flexible, and innovative professional liability solutions to engineering firms and ACEC members. As a Victor insured, you have access to free, on-demand continuing education courses, automated contract reviews, and endless risk management tools and resources to help manage projects and grow your business. Visit www.victorinsuranceus.com forward slash ACEC to learn more. Welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast, presented by the American Council of Engineering Companies and sponsored by Victor Insurance Managers, one of the largest and most experienced underwriting managers of professional liability and specialty insurance programs in the world. In September 2021, Willis a &E completed a survey of claims managers from 12 professional liability carriers. Dan Bulow, Managing Director of Willis a &E, presented the aggregated results from the survey at the recent fall conference. And we caught up with him there to discuss some of the key trends facing engineering firms today. Welcome to the program. Thank you. So uh, can you give us a, uh, an overview of claim trends? Are, are they becoming more frequent? Are they becoming more severe? Uh, well, uh, based on this survey that we did where we, we went to 12 architects and engineer professional liability carriers on the, on the question of uh, trends, you know, we're looking at frequency and severity. That's how uh, carriers are looking at it. And so, uh, and, the, and the question of frequency, uh, it was relatively stable. Uh, it was the, was the consensus amongst these carriers. Now, keep in mind, uh, when we say stable, uh, the average design firm uh, is going to have uh, one out of four design firms will have a claim. And, and that's also from this same survey, that 20 to 30 claims per 100 firms and professional liability firms. So I would argue that, yes, it's stable. However, that's a fair amount of frequency. And firms really have to be prepared because any firm that has gone through a claim, in this case, one out of four firms are going to have one, uh, they know that there's a significant cost that comes with that claim. Not only are there hard costs where you have you know, the deductible expense and potential expenses over and above your insurance uh, as your rates go up. But anybody that's been through a claim know the, those intangibles or those soft costs, the distraction to your business, uh, the, uh, the significant impact on your client relationships and uh, your reputation is all at risk for a claim. So those firms that invest in risk management are more profitable for that reason. At the end of the day, they're in a position to mitigate potential claims and reduce that frequency. So that's, it's, that's an astounding number to me that one out of every four firms will face a claim per year? Yeah, that's the average. Now keep in mind that maybe there's 100 plus thousand firms out there, right? And, uh, and of that, 90% of those design firms are under 10 professionals and less. And then if you consider the ENR 500 will have number one on that list of gross revenues, may have several billion in gross revenues, where number 500 on that list is 20 million. So you've got quite a different range. So small firms uh, may not have the frequency as large firms, but all firms are, are challenged, the smallest to the largest, with what is really uh, a risk that all firms have. As I described in my presentation today at the ACC event was that, you know, design professionals are a needy group. And the reason I say that is because design professionals take on a disproportionate amount of risk for reward. Uh, design professionals live in a hostile, litigious environment where there's an awful lot of over lawyering going on. You have an evolving standard of care and a great deal of emerging risk to contend with. So, um, a &E, uh, from your talk today, you, you, you said that a &E has a reputation as a long tail business with claims taking a long time to settle. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so the same survey said the average claim on a professional liability will take two to three years to settle. And so that means that uh, it's a long tail exposure. And that's an insurance jargon, we'll say, whereas 
uh, on the case of auto insurance, for example, that's a short tail exposure. So if you have an auto accident, you're going to know in a relatively short period of time who did what, the extent of your damages, not the case with professional liability. Uh, by the time you actually and everybody that works with you in your business, you work and you, and you put together a design and it's actually constructed and you go forward and you get dragged into mediation, uh, arbitration and or litigation, it can be two to three years from today. So that, what we mean by that, that's a long time. That's a long period of time. So if you recognize that fact, you have to recognize the importance to be able to tell your story in the future. So if you rely on the anecdotal testimony of a former employee of yours two, three years from now to get you out of jail, so to speak, uh, you're not in a very good position. So that's why it's so important that firms recognize the importance of being able to tell their story through effective documentation. And I would say there's three forms of documentation you need to be thinking about. The first is your contract. Having a good contract and using that agreement to establish expectations. Hopefully it's an insurable agreement. It's a fair, balanced agreement. And then you would amend that agreement if and when scope would creep. So you keep and actively manage that is so important. Second form of documentation would be the use of emails. Uh, we don't use certified mail anymore. We're using emails. And emails are a very important tool. It's a double-edged sword. You've got to be careful with emails. But they need to be used, uh, again, to document what's going on. And then the third form would just be a memo to the file. So that, again, somebody picks up this file two to three years from now and wants to help you get you out and extricate you from a claim, uh, this documentation will prove critical. So, I mean, just as, a, as, a, as an outsider... I mean, they're, they're more frequent, they're more severe, and they take two or three years to work through. This is like, this would be a real drag on a business if, if you get hit with something like this. You know, and it is, and it's a, it's a concern, you know, and as I always try to say when I'm doing my programs, I, it's not my objective to scare you out of the design profession. On the contrary, I, you know, I think we're in a position to heighten the awareness so that design firms can take on risk. You must take on risk, obviously, to do business. But those firms that are managing that risk and they understand it and they're making those investments to train their staff and to review and work through their contracts and they're holding their ground when it comes to the standard of care and they're effectively communicating with their clients are in a lot better position to manage this evolving risk. What, what types of, uh, of, of uh, projects generate the most claims? Well, on this survey, the, the, the project types that came up front and center, uh, long, high on the list uh, for project types, was infrastructure and, and residential condo, okay? And so uh, infrastructure projects are being driven because of the alternative uh, delivery method of design build, which has proven to be uh, a, a problem. And then the uh, and condominiums and residential is uh, always high on that list. Uh, all carriers will tell you, and a lot of carriers won't write condos. Uh, they won't want to work with a project or with a uh, architect or an engineer that does a lot of condos because condos bring an incredible amount of third-party exposure. You've got a developer that's often a single-purpose LLC. Uh, and so on. And so you've got this, uh, whereas most projects, uh, claims will roll in around substantial completion in the case of, of condos, you know, oftentimes at the 11th hour around this statute of limitation or repose, the expiration there, you'll have a, an attorney out there and there's plaintiff attorneys out there that have in their docket system the statute of limitation repose of every condo that's ever been built and they're going to contact that HOA that probably did not a great, do, do a great job maintaining uh, that property, and they're going to contact them and tell them it's your fiduciary responsibility uh, to possibly bring suit. And, and usually, unfortunately, does the design professional is the last, last person standing there with insurance. And, and so what about, um, about the disciplines? Which, which disciplines did the survey show are the most often to, to get claims? The most on a severity basis is tends to be structural engineers uh, a begin, because the fix for a problem is, uh, is a significant cost for structural. Um, MEPs, uh, because the climate was an issue, climate change was, uh, was some of the things that came out of our survey was certainly an impact where we're seeing higher claims in the area of that. But architects, 
are the winner when it comes to get, who gets sued the most, and civils are second, and that's because of the vicarious exposure that these professionals bring uh, onto their firm because they're hiring others, they're hiring subconsultants. And so the takeaway from that is that firms need to really be thinking about how to manage that vicarious risk. Who are they gonna work with and partner with? Uh, the quality of those subconsultants is so important. Consistency of documents is so important. If you're, if you're subconsultant, uh, if you're stuck with an arbitration clause, for example, you better make sure that your uh, subconsultant also is stuck with one as well. Um, consistency of docs is important. The limits of insurance, what's appropriate limits and so forth. Now, you know, on that list, Geotex is also high on that list. Uh, and a lot of, of these same carriers don't write geotex, and they just choose not to. Now, Why we, is that? It's just a, a significant exposure. Okay. And so the vicarious liability of hiring a geotech uh, is if a, a firm has to think, do they want to take that exposure on? Isn't it better for the owner to hire the geotech directly? Now, I have a lot of clients that are geotechs, and I think it's in their best interest as well rather than rely on the owner's flow-down provisions of a contract that they did not negotiate with, you know, based on what the prime did or did not do, they're better off also negotiating with that client, I believe, on a direct basis. Um, you also mentioned um, the difference between technical and non-technical issues and having an impact, uh, having a, a basically changing as, as in, in recent years. Yeah. What, what, what's that? So... So when we say technical or non-technical, a technical claim is one where there's an actual error and omission. You, you made a mistake on your plans or drawings. Uh, the non-technical is, is, is that you're brought into a claim and it's not rooted in an error or omission. And this is really an important point to understand here is that the vast majority of claims against design professionals are rooted in non-technical error. Now, we've seen a rise in, in, errors against, in claims against design professionals due to technical error, which is rooted in the staffing issue. Work is being pushed down to levels of, of uh, folks that are not as experienced, and that's a, creating a rise in technical error. But what's important is that design professionals need to know that a lot of these claims are coming and rooted in expectations not being established and managed and can focus, and that's the good news, is that they can focus on their risk management practices around these non-technical areas. Contracts, for example. Using that contract as a vehicle to establish expectations with your client. Actively managing throughout that process, the contact track process, having a, 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 I always say, a dramatic reading with your staff of every, of every contract before you send them out on a project so they understand how else can they manage scope creep and so forth. Uh, client selection, you know, is this the right client for you? Does this client, uh, you know, if this client is unreasonable in the contract formation phase, how reasonable are they going to be down the road? Do they have the experiment, experience and wherewithal uh, to, to meet their end of the obligations? Is, are there appropriate contingencies in place and so forth? And then there's the team capabilities. Do you have the right staffing for this? for this project and so forth uh, that can assume and control this risk. And lastly, effective documentation. You know, as I mentioned, it's a long tail business, so you need to be able to tell your story in the future and have an effective documentation process throughout the project and throughout your firm is critical. And um, in, in the survey, you addressed emerging risks that, the, that the, these, uh, these carriers see. What, what, what are some of the highlights there? A lot of emerging risks uh, that they brought up in this survey that we did, um, the two that really stood out that everyone agreed upon was uh, climate change and social inflation. Um, in the case of climate change, as I say, you know who believes in climate change? The insurance industry, okay? Uh, they have a great deal at risk, the insurable losses, and we've seen a significant amount of claims uh, as a result of this. Uh, and so... Firms need to be thinking about this, and we need to put more around risk management practices because what you're going to see is that these clients are going to want to rely on antiquated codes to take the cheap route, whereas more resilient design might be necessary. And so what will that firm do to document this uh, so that they're not being stuck, if you will, with the liability and the risk down the road if this isn't enough? Because these 100-year storms aren't coming every 100 years anymore. No. 
And so we have to be proactive. We cannot sit back and let this client uh, derive all the benefit and, and you take on all the risk. It, there has to be a lot more conversation, a lot more discussion around what the contractual obligations are, the feasibility studies as part of the plans, the limitation liability or what have you in your contracts and so forth is really important. The other area was this, uh, we call it social inflation. And, and what that is, is that there's just a lot more verdicts uh, that are coming in at a lot higher. And, and where I, in that earlier question, that frequency was relatively stable. In the case of severity, all of the carriers, almost every one of the carriers said they're seeing a, a spike, an upward trend in the severity of claims. That means that these claims are paying out. And severity will depend. It's maybe a couple hundred thousand or more, depending on the size of the firm, what constitutes a severity claim. But the bottom line is that there's a lot more claims that are taking longer and, and, and costing more to resolve. And, and on top of that, you know, with social inflation, you have, you know, a jury pool made up of folks that are, all, are not all that sympathetic. You've got bodily injury claims that are coming in that are at multiple, you know, very high levels that, again, are coming against the design professional. And you have uh, law firms out there that are able to invest with third-party, you know, funding that are essentially litigation financing, uh, which is a trend also that's concerning in the industry. Wow. Um, sometimes uh, uh, carriers have to de choose to deny a claim. What, what are some of the reasons that they presented for denying claims? So the, the number one reason that a, uh, that a carrier will deny a claim, and this was one of the most overwhelming results of the survey when you asked all these carriers, and it's failure to timely report. And so every uh, insured must recognize that this coverage, professional liability, and that's what we're talking about here, which is your greatest exposure, is on claims made coverage. And what you need to know about that is in order to trigger that coverage that you bought and paid for, you have to report your claim. And it's my philosophy and my group's philosophy uh, at Willis a &E that we want our clients to tender to report any claim, and a claim is a demand for money or service, okay? And I don't care if you think it's going to go away or it's going to be under your deductible. You want to preserve coverage, and any good carrier realizes that. So they're okay with the idea that you, re you reported a claim, but, you know, it didn't, real it didn't materialize in any anything. But that's the number one reason they will deny a claim. So you want to report those claims. And that does not include pre-claim matters. You know, a, a, a pre-claim matter uh, is not even included, as I said, in those frequency, one out of four claims. A pre-claim is, is a very important uh, coverage benefit that every design professional should have and, and take advantage of, and that a claim where it's a, de a demand for money or service, a pre-claim could be a, an invitation to um, a deposition or some, your client wants to subpoena your records. Well, you don't want to go to that deposition without counsel or respond to that subpoena without advice, with counsel. And your, your policy will allow you to get counsel, often of your choice, and the carrier will pay for that, and it won't count as a claim. It's a huge coverage benefit that everyone should be taking advantage of. And, and firms don't want to perhaps make a claim because they don't want to have that go against their record? Right. And, and again, the downside of not reporting is so great. Uh, so you definitely want to trigger coverage. You can always explain that. A good broker together with a good carrier will understand that. The other area that came with in that survey about denying claims is that if, the, if, if they settled on their own, if the, if the insurer decided to agree to a set-off provision, uh, a set-off, or just to go ahead and unilaterally uh, agree to a settlement, that is a problem, and you have to remember that your insurance policy, your professional liability policy, is a contract, and there's two sides of that contract. There's you and there's the, uh, the carrier, and each of you have your own obligations and responsibilities. In this case, you can't unilaterally uh, go ahead and settle a claim. So you okay. definitely want to engage your partners, engage your broker partner, engage the carrier, and take advantage of pre-claim assistance. To close up here, let's, let's talk about what firms can do to, to limit their risk. What, you mentioned emails and social media. That's, that's, a, that's a way to control your risk. It is. Now, you know, I think investing in education, 
having go, no go considerations for every project type. So design build, for example, has been a very dip- difficult risk. It really has. We haven't seen the inherent bez- uh, benefits of design build because, uh, frankly, the, the, on the client side, the DOTs, because infrastructure in particular, is shifting risk down to the general contractor, which flows down to the engineer. And, and, the, and there's just been a whole lot of claims, and we've had a lot of conversation around some of the things that we need to be thinking about. And all, it has to evolve into progressive design build, ultimately, to really make a truly design build and get that owner to the table. But as far as risk management is that, these, these insureds going into this, recognizing the risks of these different areas. So if you're going into design build, what are your no-go, no-go considerations? Uh, you, a no-go, for example, with a lot of firms, we're not going to be responsible for quantities, for example. Uh, condos, if you're going to be working with condos, what are your go, no-go considerations? Uh, are you going to want to make sure that, you know, who that developer is, the quality of that developer? Uh, are there, what is there a condo rider that's going to address maintenance and so forth and so on? So at the end of the day, I think it's really staying close to your staff, communicating them because as you, you touched on emails, for example, you know, you know, the problem with emails is that everybody's a little too informal with emails and everything is discoverable. Nobody's ever deleted an email in your life. And so you, you need to treat emails uh, you need to treat them as a business. You need to be professionals, uh, positive, and I always say, you know, don't forget you can pick up the phone. But also consider, you know, uh, social media. You don't want to be uploading project files or, or pictures of your project. If your firm is stuck with an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, that could be a violation. What are you doing about uh, chat functions with, with Zoom and Teams and so forth? What are you doing about photographs? How long? So what are your firm's document retention policies around that? And really what you got to keep doing is talking. You got to keep communicating and talking with all levels of everybody in your staff. There's a lot to think about. So. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously, I mean, the, the cost of not thinking is so high that it's, it's really something firms need to focus on. Absolutely. All righty. Well, we've been talking with Don Bulow of Willis A&E. Thanks so much. Thank you. All righty. All right.